Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the class of 1991, uh, 23 new panel. Um, I just want to take a minute to introduce our moderator, Joe Cruz, um, and he is going to be moderating our panel on liberal arts and life in the nonprofit world. Eats impacting communities. And I'm very excited about our panel, and we have Eats from all over here to talk. Um, Joe, who's our moderator, is a professor here and an alum of our class, and he is a professor of philosophy, and he is chair of both cognitive science and history of science at Williams College. He specializes in philosophy of mind and theory of knowledge, and he has written numerous articles on topics as at the intersection of philosophy, cognitive psychology, and cognitive neuroscience. I told Joe I don't really understand what he does, so I got through that okay. Um, while at Williams, uh, Joe has chaired the Committee on Athletics and the Committee on Undergraduate Life, and he served on the Faculty Steering Committee, and he's coached the cycling team. In his uh, free time, he likes to travel the world as a cyclist and an adventure photographer. And he is married to another alum, Margaret Cody, from the class of 95. He splits his time between Williamstown and Brooklyn, New York, his native hometown. So I'm going to, with that, turn this over to Joe and the panel, and I hope you all enjoy this this afternoon. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. I've been instructed to keep my introductory remarks uh, under 75 minutes, which is <laughs> tough because that's the smallest unit of talking that professors are capable of. <laughs> Welcome, fellow alums, families, friends of the college. It's lovely to see you on this lovely day. I hope you didn't injure yourself on your Blair Road run this morning. I want to especially acknowledge the class of 1991 folks who are here for their 25th reunion. We're here for our 25th day. Great to see you. Great to see you. For me, the most evocative metaphor for the liberal arts is that it's a conversation. It's a searching conversation, it's tenacious, it's honest. It's one where no question should escape our scrutiny. It's a conversation that's best with a balance between giving and listening. It achieves harmony and insight when it includes everyone's voice in a global curiosity and a local fervor. It's a small seminar in Stetson Hall but it's also a graduating senior class that's more representative of our world than ever, and a class that speaks about hope and promise and limitation. It's all of you, and all of you as you think and talk with your neighbors and in your communities. The liberal arts is the dynamic invention of ideas and the cultivation of wisdom. I'm honored to introduce four of my distinguished classmates who will begin our conversation about liberal arts and the nonprofit world. They bring an incredible wealth and diversity to us today. And I look forward to how our speaking together unfolds. We have Ramona Liberoff, she's CEO of Spring Accelerator. Spring Accelerator is a Department for International Development, USAID, and Nike Foundation program, which equips high growth businesses in East Africa and South Asia with human-centered design and other tools to innovate for the needs of adolescent girls. We've got Peter Angst, the Senior Regional Director of the Wilderness Society, the well-known National Conservation Group. Peter provides management and policy leadership for the organization's programs in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and Alaska. We have Cliff Majersik, Executive Director for the Institute for Market Transformation, which is a nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C that promotes energy efficiency in buildings. Cliff oversees IMT's activities in building performance, energy codes, energy efficiency finance, and green leasing. And philosophy major Judy Conti. Judy Conti, federal advocacy coordinator of national employment law, that, that project. She advances NELP's priorities for low income and unemployed workers in Congress with administrative agencies and the administration. Ramona, Peter, Cliff, and Judy are leaders in a global conversation on doing good. Their work includes partnerships with government and the private sector and academic institutions. Everyone in this room is familiar with skepticism about the value of liberal arts and with questions about the path from four years at Williams to a career, to a life with genuine meaning, and to a connection with the world. 
Our four panelists will share with us their work and their trajectory to it. By the end, we'll have four concrete biographies that show us ways to change the world. Let's thank our panelists. We'll start with Ramona. Thanks very much, Jeff. Can everyone hear me, or do I have to actually introduce a microphone to this? Uh, <laughs> I thought the acoustics were excellent in this place. Um, I think it's just on. It's just on? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Right. Hello, everyone. It's fantastic. It's slightly surreal to be here. And I love that Joe introduces as distinguished, which in my word, world is code for old and gray. <laughs> so, um, lovely to be here, old and graying as we are. I think we all look extremely distinguished. Um, it's, it's a really interesting challenge. Um, I, I seem to remember being one of the people to suggest, why do we have a panel on careers and not profit? And then, of course, I end up with the prize of actually having to do something for it, um, which serves me right. Um, but the challenge we were set was to try and tell a story about um, the relationship between the liberal arts and, more specifically, our experience at Williams and how we got to where we are. I really wish I could say that there was some incredibly neat, beautiful story that I'm going to tell all of you. Um, but if the liberal arts does one thing for you, it makes you tolerant of the fact that things sometimes just happen. Um, if I had to point to one source I'd refer everyone to as they think about how to make the biggest difference in their life, it's actually a book by an economist who is also a philosopher called John Kay. And the book is called Obliquity. And it's effectively about how great things happen usually by completely indirect means, which is a completely different story than you hear um, in all the business press and others where everyone seems to have had this perfect, sort of almost godlike ascent to the heights of being absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'll pick on both a few qualities um, that I'm not sure about cause or effect, um, but how the liberal arts relate to doing good or something purposeful in the world. And then also a few elements of experience um, that I think have really helped in that regard. So again, first starting with qualities, I think when I was reflecting on kind of what does a liberal arts education give you or what does the pursuit of a liberal arts education um, sort of mean to you, um, it's a few things. First of all, I think... Um, it makes you skeptical and question, but it also makes you want to be part of a solution rather than a problem. I think that liberal arts does create an environment where people are happy also to work with a great different set of talents, which increasingly in the complex challenges that we look at, um, you know, you need. You can't have, for example, just science and technology fix everything. You actually do need philosophy. You need to understand equity and fairness before you start out in things like development. So sort of skepticism, but with hope, I think is a good quality. Um, another one is actually to be confident with complexity or to acknowledge that we don't need to know everything because frankly the range of things we're forced to do and take, I still remember some of my science classes that I wasn't particularly brilliant at or you know, conversations with people doing complex maths. It reminds you that no one can be an expert in everything but you should be able to appreciate what, all, what disciplines can bring to bear um, when you're thinking about complex challenges. And I think also curiosity and a sense that things are connected. Um, Ever increasingly, all the issues in the world, you know, I'm looking at things like gender equity in Bangladesh. Um, you will have to think about things like climate change and you have to think about things like terrorism, sadly, when you look at that. In the past, these things would have been atomized into very different development programs looking at each aspect in silos. But a liberal arts education helps you look at those things all together. So those things, you know, confidence with complexity, an understanding and appreciation of expertise, but knowing you don't have to have all the answers, and a certain skepticism or inquiring mind combined with a, a, a focus on solutions are all very helpful. So kind of everyone in this room could do exactly as we've done and set our energies to, to these problems with the right equipment at hand. Um, but in terms of how I got there, um, I also wasn't afraid of failing quite often on the way in the last 25 years. I've kind of had more jobs than most people have had hot dinners. Um, I've been made redundant three separate times in six years, which really does seem like something of a talent. Um, and what I realized was also the things that you do in your personal life. For example, I took up impact investing um, after a spectacular failure. My last reunion, I was um, heading strategy for a way too complicated venture-backed business that just tanked totally. Um, and I took up investing because I realized it would actually be easier to invest than to actually work for a business. And that was actually one of the key competencies that's helped me with Spring, which is in part a venture accelerator. Um, the other thing is reading extremely widely, which I hope I'm not the only person in this room who still enjoys doing that. Um, but sort of tying together bits and pieces from both fiction and non-fiction, reading history and so on, um, that's something I've kept along. And it's strange how those, those bits of information become extremely handy um, as you try and not be an expert, but sort of look across the territory and survey it. 
Um, and also I'd say one of the things about the Williams experience, I would I'd just conclude with it, is that I met so many very different kinds of people who all shared qualities, but who all actually were very much themselves. And in reading the class book, um, I was humbled and gratified and really quite pleased um, to read the trajectory that people's lives had taken. Because I think, in conclusion, what Williams gives you is an appetite, a curiosity, and a determination to sort of make the world a better place. So thanks very much for giving me the opportunity. I'll pass on. Thank you. Thank you. So, come on, okay. Um, well, I'm happy to be here, and I think we should all be outside for a hike having this discussion. <laughs> this is a um, maybe what I'll do is I'll just cover a bit of my trajectory since Williams, which has almost all been in the nonprofit sector, then uh, speak a little bit to what my experiences have been in terms of working in the nonprofit field, and conclude a little bit on this question about a liberal arts education and how, it, how it's worked uh, for me in terms of being effective in nonprofits. Um, so pretty much right out of college, I, after a little bit of play, I ended up with an internship in a nonprofit through a Williams Connection um, it, for a conservation group, which then turned into a job. This is in Montana, where I live now too, uh, called the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. That, uh, as I said, turned into a job where I was there for five or six years. Uh, learned a lot, went off to graduate school, and from that then uh, kind of moved to Canada for a organization called the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, which represents organizations working on wildlife connectivity, uh, habitat protection from, as it sounds, Yellowstone to the Yukon up and down the Rockies. Uh, for several years of that, I then relocated back to uh, Bozeman, Montana, where I am, and started at the Wilderness Society, as you heard, uh, about 14 years ago, and have had a couple different as is probably true with most nonprofits, several different positions and roles uh, in that organization. Um, I guess the one commonality amongst all these, these three different jobs I've had has been that they, they're all four, as you, you, know, you can tell, uh, kind of conservation, outdoor wildlife conservation related groups. They're all advocacy based groups. So there's a spectrum within the nonprofit field, obviously, in terms of how people uh, or how organizations get their work done and, and the impact they have. These have all been ones that are uh, on the advocacy side, meaning lobbying, litigating, but also things like uh, collaborating, uh, you know, commissioning science uh, studies and reports to be done. So a spec communication education kind of effort. So a kind of a, a variety of, of tactics, if you will, in terms of how the work gets done. Um, one of the things I think should be said, uh, I think most anyone who's worked in nonprofits can probably relate, is that there is certainly an element of the work that is not glorious, that is fairly mundane, uh, fairly, where, where you sit back and you say, wait, I went to college to do this? Uh, you know, and, and to this day, even as, you know, in maybe a more uh, senior level position, there's times where you are spending time organizing events, sitting at a table, uh, giving the same presentation over and over, um, you know, writing the kind of form comment letter for people to use, that, that sort of stuff, which is not really uh, rocket science, to say the least. Um, but part of what's kept me in the field, I guess, is there's another element that I have found across the 25 years uh, working in these different nonprofits and conservation, and that is the, the unexpected, the surprises, the things that kind of, uh, you, would, you kind of pinch yourself and you're like, I never would have believed I'd be sitting here doing this. Uh, and that, you know, frankly, take you sometimes out of your comfort zone. Um, some examples I can provide of that, uh, I remember this was early on, so it was only a few years out of Williams uh, at the time, doing a press conference, the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. with um, Michael Keaton, then of you know, the Batman movie had just come out, and so we were there together doing a, a press conference with all these reporters. Uh, um, or another experience, as I've often in, in the work I do, we've done uh, overflights, small planes where you fly up. Um, to kind of show the area from the, from the air, which can get the perspective much more in terms of the threat or the habitat issues or what have you. And I've had overflights twice with governors, um, uh, once with the uh, editorial page editor of the New York Times. And so you're like, well, this is pretty cool, um, you know, having that kind of experience. Uh, just a year ago, I got to have a pretty high level meeting at the White House with the chair of the Blackfeet tribe uh, and Obama's initiative with, um, tribal work, which was, um, so things like this that I think take you kind of out of your comfort zone and are pretty special, but 
again, you still have that mundane kind of uh, in, the, in the trenches kind of slog type work that is, I think, the nature of most nonprofit work, too. Um, I guess one last thing I'll say about the nature of work in the nonprofit field I found is that there's a lot of time spent, if, you're, if you want to stay at it, about how you assess your impact, about what are the metrics you should be using to decide whether this is the right way to be spending your time, your money, whether you're having a difference. I have not worked much in the for-profit world, but it's not going to be measured, I'm pretty sure, in the nonprofit world by how much money you've raised or how, you know, whether you've spent that money and it's had this return on investment. It's probably not going to be spent on whether you've doubled your staff or how you've grown. It's different kinds of metrics in terms of how you, you kind of think about the impact and assess it uh, in nonprofit work. Uh, so to close, in terms of liberal arts uh, and my thinking back on my Williams education, I, you know, I was one of the ones, probably like a lot of you, um, when I was at Williams, I think I switched majors probably like five times. When I was, I was going to be a philosophy major, actually, at the beginning, um, in biology, I ended up being geology and environmental studies and English. And, um, and in some ways, that kind of uh, set me up well for the nonprofit uh, world and that work, um, both because it made me confident to be able to kind of know that I don't have to be an expert. I can be an expert in nothing. Uh, I can be multidisciplinary, and as Ramona said, I can be curious about a lot of things. Uh, that's, that's, that's kind of the nature of nonprofit work, is having that curiosity and that confidence, I think, to kind of dabble and to be able to relate on a whole bunch of other things. Uh, the last thing, I guess, in terms of a liberal arts education is a lot of, at least in my experience for nonprofit work, a lot of it is having a real competency in how you communicate, um, certainly how you write being able to synthesize and write effectively, uh, as well as how you can kind of communicate in other you know, uh, uh, avenues, whether orally or others. And there's something about a liberal arts education, I think, that really does uh, set you up better for that. I've certainly seen it when I've been hiring people who maybe don't come from a distinguished place like Williams and uh, have struggled, frankly, in terms of their ability to write or to communicate in other ways, um, even though they may have lots of other um, skills. There's something about nonprofit work where that Communication strength is a core kind of core essay. So I'll end it there. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Cliff, take it away. Uh, thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. My name, as you heard, is Cliff Majerzyk. I'm with the class of 91. Uh, and uh, a little bit of 91 pride. Uh, I just learned that uh, we have now set the all time record for reunion attendance. Uh, we better, we knocked off our JAs, class of 89. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a good day. I'm, I'm always happy to come to a reunion. I'm always happy to see all my old friends here. Uh, and uh, I would completely agree with everything that you heard from Ramona and Peter. Uh, I think that liberal arts education has been tremendously helpful for me in my work. Uh, and as, I, as we hire people, uh, I often, you know, we're looking for the skills that, uh, that Williams and colleges like Williams provide. Uh, and they're the hardest skills to find. I, I, we find that, that knowledge of content, uh, it's, you know, the, the particular content of what we work on, it's important, but it's not as hard to find and it's not as hard to learn. But if you don't know how to write well, if you don't know how to communicate well orally, if you don't know how to put yourself in the place of those who are listening to you uh, and understand how they're thinking, ask a question, what's in it for me, and how do I pitch what I'm saying to them with that in mind, that's something that's not easily taught and that we really, you know, we do, we do actually you know, coach some of our people on that. But ultimately, if they don't come to us with those skills, the odds that they'll succeed at my organization are much lower. Uh, there are certain roles that don't require that as much, but that's all, those are always the skills that we find are in short supply. Uh, so uh, a little bit about my organization. I'm the executive director of the Institute for Market Transformation, which is a green building, energy efficiency, and building organization. Um, we focus on uh, trying to work to make all buildings uh, energy efficient. Uh, and that's an enormous challenge, and we're a small organization. We have 35 people, and there are thousands of companies, millions of people, whose decisions we need to influence uh, if we want to reach our goal. There's more than $400 billion a year is spent on energy for buildings in America, 
and there's a trillion dollar opportunity to cost effectively improve the energy efficiency of those buildings. So you know, we have the economic winds at our back, at least in theory, because there's money to be made from making our buildings better. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be giving this talk in a good green building like this one. Uh, and I think the college has done a very good job in recent years on that score. Uh, but the reality is that for many reasons, inertia um, and uh, misaligned incentives between landlords and tenants and builders and architects and the tenants and, and owners that ultimately will occupy those buildings, our buildings are just don't, are typically not designed, built, or operated for efficiency. And it's, it's a loss for everybody. It makes for less comfortable buildings and less healthy buildings, uh, wasted money, lost jobs, uh, and climate emissions. Uh, and that's a big part of what animates uh, the funders that, that fund my organization is concerned about climate change. And, and, and for that reason, and there's actually a very tangible metric that we're often you know, held to account. Now, there's all kinds of assumptions that have to go into calculating these metrics, but ultimately, they want to produce the maximum climate benefit, the maximum impact in preventing or delaying climate change for every dollar that they invest. And, and so the question is, should they invest that in my organization or another organization? And the, the, the challenge is always, how do we calculate that? What metrics can we use to approximate our impact? Um, so stepping back now uh, and talking about how I started. So I, I came to Williams. Uh, I came to Williams actually in part because I, I wanted to look at political science and economics. And I ended up being a political economy major. So in that sense, um, I sort of ended where I thought I would. Uh, and in, in fact, I used my political economy sort of learning uh, every day in my work. Um, uh, while I was here, I got involved with Massburg, and, and we got involved in the Tax Use Reduction Initiative. We ultimately we succeeded in getting a law passed in Massachusetts, and we actually went out and persuaded Williamstown and 12 other local select boards to vote to uh, endorse the, the legislation, and that was our experience. And it was a great learning ground for how do you do advocacy at a local level. Uh, and I, I graduated, I, I did, it was a terrible economy, I didn't immediately go into anything environmental. Actually, my first job out of college was working for the New York DA's office, listening to Wiretaps of Mafiosa for Elliot Spitzer. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was a, definitely a detour, uh, and actually, at the time I, I went there, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, and that job disabused me of that notion. <laughs> uh, and, and from there, I did go to environmental, I came down to Washington, D.C. in 92, and I've lived in D.C. since then, so I've now spent more than half of my life in Washington, D.C., uh, and I worked on trying to lobby to reform the Superfund law, the toxic um, law, uh, and, uh, and we had, I had corporate clients you know, in that capacity, and, and I, I think that one thing that, that, that helped me to, to realize is if you ever want to make change on an economy-wide scale, if you ever want billions of dollars spent towards addressing a societal problem, someone better be making some money from that. Uh, and so you really need to set the rules of the game so that companies can profit from doing the right thing. Uh, and that's now very much what my organization does. After doing that for a couple years, um, I actually started an internet software company uh, back in 94 when, when Netscape was the brand new thing. <laughs> uh, and did that for a couple years in management consulting. Uh, so there I really got more into thinking about how do you build a business case? And that's very much something that I do in my work now. Uh, and, uh, but I'll, that variety, I think, sort of echoes a liberal arts education. It's thinking of, from various different angles. You know, these problems, as Ramona said, are complicated problems that have many influences and many people that uh, are hurt and benefit from any particular action. And being able to think through that complexity is enormously helpful. Uh, and, and also, just the fundamental thing, and I run into this all the time, it's causation and causality are very different. And unfortunately, throughout you know, the media, everywhere, that those things are confused. And, and embracing the complexity and af asking the tough questions are always sort of critically important to solving any problem. And I think that's especially true when you're trying to sort of make societal change, as we are. So um, uh, ultimately, um, in 2002, I, I went to work for my organization. Uh, I didn't found it. Um, I was the second employee. It was founded in 96. Um, and we, I've, we've grown it um, a lot since then, obviously. Uh, and we work with, with mayors and cities. We work with 50-some cities around the country. Uh, uh, foundation um, paid for employees of my organization that work out of the mayor's offices of these cities that help them put in place programs and policies to drive energy efficiency in buildings. And one of our things is the power of data. You know, you can't manage what you don't measure. So one of the things that we do is put in place, effectively, like 
um, mandatory uh, miles per gallon stickers or labels that are actually online for buildings so that the market has information about the performance of buildings so that tenants can find a high performing building. So uh, you know, a company can say, I'm a high performing company, I have high performing employees, why wouldn't I want to be in a high performing building? So we're trying to address some of the split incentives problem and, and drive change. Uh, so uh, the fact that our name is in supermarket transformation is occasionally helpful. It allows me to go in and, you know, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce or Heritage Foundation, you know, it, it allows us to sort of appeal to a, a broad cross-section, just people that believe in the power of markets, whether or not they believe in climate change, you know, we can work with them. Uh, so I think I've probably said enough. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Judy Conti. Um, you know, I was really struck by what Joe had said at the beginning about the liberal arts in general being under attack right now, it really is, and some of it very politically motivated. And if liberal arts is under attack, us philosophy majors are the chief punching bags, right? <laughs> I, was, I was telling Joe, a couple of years ago, I was at a, a political event with then Governor Bob McDonald from Virginia, who's rather infamous right now. Um, and he was publicly questioning whether the state universities in Virginia should be offering philosophy degrees, because what do you do with those? So I marched myself right up to him afterwards and introduced myself as a constituent and said, you know, Governor, in our shared profession of public policy and law, I've really never found my philosophy degree to be all that much of a waste because I think about ethics and morality and, and public <laughs> policy. And I had no idea what that was all going to mean three years later, right? Um, to, to his credit, he said, you know, as soon as I said that, I, I knew somebody was going to call me on it. I just didn't think it would be quite that quickly. <laughs> but as I, as I reflect on that, you know, there's sort of three, I think, very formative parts of my Williams experience that that led me into the nonprofit field for sure. And, and one of them was being a philosophy major. I mean, we spent our time thinking about morality and ethics and not the truth, but trying to find a truth and, and reason and rationality in this world or not. Um, and I think that inquiry in general is one that drives the curiosity that, that we're all talking about. Um, and it was one that, that drove me to um, studying music and theater and philosophy and history and literature, not so much in the maths and sciences, those weren't my things, but, um, you know, to take a really broad array, I remember when those early years when you're still coming out of school and people are looking at your college transcripts like they matter, they would look at my transcripts and say, you, you seem to have taken a little bit of everything, and, and it, that, that breath, I think, is something that drives all of us. I would imagine that, um, I think many people are in the nonprofit world are people that see the the forests more so than the trees. And it's not that we ignore the trees, but the, the big pictures and the big inquiry is one that really challenges us. I, I think one of the second things is just the, the dialogue and discourse with, with my classmates. Um, you know, I, I tell so many people that going to college is, is at some level it's about the professors and the, the level of the academic instruction, but it's about the, the quality of the people you're interacting with in your dormitories and in your dining halls. And I think of my, my freshman year roommates, Monica Brand, who's sitting right there, and Marion DeFisi, who, who really opened my eyes to, to the, the global world in a way that I really hadn't thought about before, to uh, Kirsten Staples, who really, I think, it worked to educate all of us about what, what feminism and what gender equity in this world really means. With, with my friend Charlie, who we've discussed music and religion and and how the beach is the perfect reflection of all that's good in the world. And <laughs> Robin Nyorf and I spent so much time talking about theater as a, a, ref, a reflection of society, as a, a driving force of change. Uh, and, and all of this and the conversations that we had, that, that, again, that curiosity, Ramona, I think that's just such an important word. Um, and, and all of the problems of the world we tried to solve in, in Baxter or Greylock or the Dodd Dining Halls and all the late night conversations in the dormitories when we should have been sleeping for those 8 a.m. classes we had the next morning. But instead we had to talk about religion and God and what the world really means just one more time. And I think that's something that's, that's never really left me from the years here. Um, and then I think the, the third really key experience for me here that, that drove me, I, I came to law school knowing I wanted to be a lawyer, thinking I wanted to litigate, which I did for a while and loved, um, and, and expecting I was going to be a philosophy major, actually. I knew that coming in as well. Um, but I didn't quite know where that was all going to go. And while I was here, I got to know a wonderful family in town. Um, many of you may know Dick and Carol DeMeo, who were and are um, the heart and soul of this town in a lot of ways. 
um, in, in, in every civic affair you can imagine. In particular, Carol set up a, a food bank in this city. Um, and I got to know them through the, the Catholic Church and a youth group that we worked with together. Um, and in this, this town with this beautiful campus with the, the, you know, sort of all of the privilege that we have being here, and, and I do say privilege re regardless of how much people struggled financially to make this possible or not, you know, just being here in the first instance was such a privilege. And um, what, what Carol and Dick showed me is that just a few miles away, there, there was a part of Williamstown in, in North Adams where, um, I mean, people couldn't eat. They, they couldn't put food on the table, literally. Um, and they put themselves out there to help that. And I, I spent a lot of time working with them at the food bank and running food drives um, and, and helping make deliveries. And um, people would always talk about how we just, we never see students from the college where we live and, and thought that it was so unusual I was there. And it was, it was something that really got me reflecting on the themes of economic security and just how crucial that is for any human beings success and well-being in this world. So I went off to law school with this notion of somehow wanting to work in the field of economic security. I thought I would work more with children, um, but found myself increasingly, for very many reasons, drawn to labor and employment law. Um, and the notion of work as, as one of the defining characteristics of so many adults. Right? I mean, we, we define ourselves by who we are, what, by, by what we do or, or, or don't do in so many ways, whether we're working in the, the formal economy or not. Um, so I, I guess in some ways too, just you know, going back to that philosophy degree, like you know, how do we define ourselves? What are the things that make us who we are at, at our core? Um, but also, I, I mean, I know that I was able to come to a school like this and have the life that I did uh, for, for many reasons, including my father had a really good, secure job with health care, with benefits. Um, he, was, he was never worried about being unemployed. And we were never worried about whether or not I could go to college and whether or not it would be paid for. Um, and that security and that confidence was something that I know, um, as I got older and older, I realized how much that meant to me. So I, I went into this field of, of economic justice, if you will. Um, first with a public interest law firm, but moving quickly into the nonprofit world and, and starting a nonprofit organization that represented low wage workers in the DC metro area. And I'm going to point to Monica again because she was on our founding board of directors and our, our treasurer as well. So it's great to do that with a, a sister Eve. Um, and it, 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 again, it just continued that, that inquiry. It continued the, the, the call to, to be the best that we can be, which is what I think the, the liberal arts is truly all about. It's like it's a, it's a higher purpose, it's a higher calling. And, it, and I don't say this to aggrandize myself or to anybody up here. So many people will say, oh, you're doing the Lord's work. I hate that. <laughs> I'm not doing the Lord's work, I'm doing Judy's work. I'm doing what I feel called to do. I'm doing what makes me happy and that satisfies me and that that's my contribution to the world and, and to myself. Um, but I, I will say that um, with the, Great respect for Peter and Peter and Ramona, who are, are still, I think, doing more management than I am doing these days, thankfully. The, the constant call to fundraise and manage and administer, just it got to be um, draining in, in a lot of ways. So I was very fortunate to be able to join the National Employment Law Project, where I serve as the federal advocacy coordinator, which is a really fancy way of saying I'm a lobbyist. Um, and you know, so I, I go back to sort of where I started with, what are you going to do with a philosophy degree? Well. I work to raise the minimum wage throughout the country. I am restoring protections to the overtime laws in this country. I help unemployed people get jobs, and I help the formerly incarcerated get jobs so that they can turn their lives around. So that's what you do with a philosophy degree from Williams. Um, and it's, it's been a wild ride, and I, I credit so much of what I learned and experienced here um, with, with the real joy that I find in the work that I do. And I'm really glad that we were able to come here and, and talk with all of you about it. So thanks very much. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. In a second, we'll, we'll open it up into a broader conversation that includes your, your questions. But if I may, I want to kick off with a, a couple for the, the panelists. It's easy which isn't to say that it's not true, but it's easy for us to celebrate the sort of expansive imagination and the, the versatility of thinking that a liberal arts education gives us. And all of you have talked about the way in which that's enabled you to view 
your fields holistically and to navigate complexity. But at the same time, and we all know it, at the same time, you had to all master specific content areas, complicated and uh, articulated fields that demand expertise. I'm wondering, I guess I'm wondering how you did it. And, and maybe if I could, if I could get, uh, if we could get Cliff and Ramona to talk about those, those questions. I mean, it seems like you guys work in some pretty demanding fields. Uh, yeah, I guess we do. I mean, I, I actually think of my organization as, uh, at its core, one of our core uh, value adds is serving as a translator. As a tr we work with architects and engineers and with the policy makers and uh, CFOs, uh, with appraisers, and you know, I could go on quite a bit. And they all speak different languages. They are all very specialized. Yet they all interact with our built environment, and they're talking past each other, and, and they're leaving money on the table effectively, they're leaving health on the table, they're leaving all kinds of benefits on the table because, because they're not communicating with each other, the buildings are worse, and they're less healthy for the people that, who live and work at them. Uh, and so I could be an engineer, I, sometimes I play, say I play an engineer on TV, I'm not an engineer, but I play one on TV, uh, but I could say the same thing about a lawyer or other thing. So, there is a need for all those people, and we have uh, several folks, uh, you know, various strengths along those lines. You know, I have no advanced degree, and most of the people that work for me do have an advanced degree, so that's sometimes a bit odd. Uh, but um, fundamentally, uh, someone needs to be a translator across the professions. You need your specialists and your people that, and sometimes you can be both a specialist and able to communicate with other specialists in their language. Um, but I think sometimes it's more helpful to be a generalist to be able to, to convey all that. Of course, I'm always having to learn on the job, you know, enough engineering to be dangerous, enough law to be dangerous, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's a great challenge. It's a lifetime learning opportunity. I really love that aspect of my work. And um, that's, I, I have my green job now, and that's a big part of it. I have two tricks that I'm going to share with you. One is to hire the best people who sort of transcend their discipline but actually have an expertise. Um, and the other is actually to really respect local context. I and mean, one of the things about doing things like anthropology or sociology or whatever is that it makes you, as, as Judy said, very respectful that there is no answer. There are only sort of a truth here and there or a perspective. So trying to bring together those different voices. For example, I have country leads in Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, my, one of my operations team is half Sudanese, half British with an American passport. Um, she says her Sudanese family say to her, you're so white. <laughs> but it's about finding boundary spanners who have, like T-shaped people in the, in the principle, who have kind of that generalist overview. I can be the uber generalist of all without any real skill. But my second trick, in addition to hiring those people and really valuing them and trying to provide a forum for them to do their best work, is to do little apprenticeships for myself. So I did actually go and get two advanced degrees. Um, well, one sort of a board of PhD and one other advanced degree in social psychology. Um, and then also doing investing, for example, because you can't really talk about building a portfolio unless you've done it yourself. So that kind of combination of talent spotting and personal apprenticeship over time um, has been kind of my trick to fake it till I, till I make it. Very good. Well, and speaking of expertise and the kinds of expertise all of you have had to cultivate, your, your work involves sometimes substantially interaction with government and the, the questions that you engage and the, the projects that you push forward are political. I'm wondering, maybe Peter and Judy, I'm wondering how do you navigate the political? Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's looking for common ground. It's, it's looking for the strange bedfellows, if you will. Um, and I think it's, it's, you have to actively work to demystify it. Um, I will tell you, and again, not to aggrandize myself, because th this isn't fancy, it isn't shiny, it's not nearly as glamorous as it sounds, but I'm in and out of the White House and working with their staff a lot. I was at a press conference yesterday speaking with two members of Congress and the Secretary of Labor. Um, and, and these are normal occurrences in D.C. and in the field that I work in. And, I, and when you meet these people and when you spend five minutes talking with them, you realize they're just normal people in it like you are as well. Um, and I think part of it is not, not putting people on pedestals, not allowing people to put themselves on pedestals. Uh, and, and remembering that, that your part in it is, is fairly ordinary as well. It's, it's important. 
Um, but it, it's, it's not exotic, and it's, it's something that, that anybody can do. If you have the knowledge and you have the passion, <coughs> there are avenues open to you to, to make impact at, at very high and very personal levels. I'm, I'm a lobbyist for unemployed people and minimum wage workers. I don't have money to spend on anybody's campaigns or anybody's PACs. And I have tremendous access um, because I care about what I do and I'm passionate about it. And people respect that passion and, and want the access and want the knowledge as a result. So um, I, I think navigating the political is, is to remember that in some ways everything is political and nothing is political. And it's, it's all just about relationships and building a relationship with a person on, on issues that you share an interest in and, and sort of nurturing that relationship by continuing to engage with them and educate them and be a resource for them and let them be a resource for you. Well, I was going to say something along the lines of relationships also, but connected to that for me, my experience in terms of navigating political and government has been also, you know, I spent a lot of time going to DC, having meetings with agency or elected officials, but the more you can get them out of their offices and in the area, in my case, out in the area where the, the kind of issue is at stake and with real people, um, the more lasting impact that has. They have so many constant meetings and engagement that's kind of at this kind of level where it feels like a part of their brain is kind of half checked out because they're just doing it all the time. So the more you can take them out of that context. The other thing I think is uh, a part of impact in government is being really good about thanking them when they do the right thing uh, in the political. Um, I think in the nonprofit, at least in the advocacy field, we often get very good at the spanking part, but not the thanking part. Um, and uh, if you do that, um, the thanking part well, that's going to then lead to, I think, supporting that first part about the relationships that you build. Um, and maybe last, I think, my experience has been in terms of uh, navigating the political and having impact has been how you think about, I mean, I didn't, I, poli sci was not one of the things I thought about as a major when I was, I never took a poli sci class when I was at Williams, but it feels like I've had a, a real life crash course in poli sci. Um, so thinking about power and about how uh, elected officials primarily, in this case, not so much agency leads, but um, the audiences and what is motivating them. And so who are the right people, the right spokespeople to be making the points? is sometimes way more important than the content and the substance of the point. Um, it's, it's, that makes a big difference, I've found, in terms of influencing or navigating the political the realm. Really good. What are your questions? What are your questions? Right up front here. Single piece of advice. Judy? Single piece I, of advice? I actually do speak to students all the time, and this is the advice that I give them. Um, Keep your eyes and your mind and your heart open. Opportunities are going to present themselves when you least expect it. And the measure of your personal greatness is going to be the risks you're willing to take when those opportunities come by. I've, I've never ended up where I thought I would be five years later, for example. And it's always been a better place. And it's because uh, at some key junctures, I, I took risks when those opportunities presented themselves. And I think that's the, the single greatest thing people can do in the nonprofit world. A in anything in particular, but the nonprofit world in particular. Um, and then and we'll get to you. Um, this is not meant to sound flippant in any way, but kind of make yourself enough money, get yourself enough material security and emotional security first, because then you won't have to worry about it again. Well, and to, on sort of a related note, um, I, I do think that uh, for many, uh, the type of work I do, and I think lots of other nonprofit work, it's enormously valuable to have for profit experience. If you're trying to convince a businessman that something is in their business interest, and you've only ever worked for a nonprofit, you have less credibility. Uh, and also, it's just if you've never had to, you know, report a PNL, it's just it's a it's a learning experience that is enormously valuable. Not for all kinds of nonprofit work, but for many kinds of nonprofit work. Um, so I think even if you think you want to end up in a nonprofit, 
there's no harm at all in at some point in your career, and quite possibly your first job out of college, going the for-profit route and learning about it. And, and think about what's the change you want to make, and who ultimately the people that can often have the biggest impact on that change are people that are working in for-profit companies. And even if you want to end up trying to be in a nonprofit on the outside, pushing them in the right direction, it's very helpful to have walked in their shoes for a while. And often, I actually, we do a lot of work with companies, and not just companies that are giving us money, but just companies that are trying, we're trying to help them do the right thing in terms of building better buildings or sharing the right information to the market. And sometimes they work with us and they want to come to work for me. And I'm like, OK, that's great. I love you. I, I would love for you to work for us. But you can actually do more good there in the for-profit company than you could here at, at my organization. So you know, in some cases, I've managed to talk people into staying where they are because I know how, what an impact that they're having from the inside. I guess I'd just say uh, find something that connects, that you're passionate about, that connects to your values and do an exemplary job on that, that that's that connection to your core kind of value and your passion is what's going to keep you going. And if you're right out of college and you do an exemplary job on that and you're able to tell a good story about why it connects to your values and how you made an impact, that's going to matter as much as anything in terms of thinking about from a professional sense, well, this sets me up for this job, which then sets me up for the skill set and all that sort of stuff. That's not been my experience and how it works in nonprofit. Peter, you want to take a shot at that? I couldn't agree more. It's a great point. Um, I have often commented, like I said earlier when in my remarks, I have not worked in the for-profit field, really. I've worked briefly in government. But um, I've often kind of thought, boy, the nonprofit sector, at least my experience as a part of the nonprofit sector, I've been on boards or you know, working for them, uh, seen we would be so much more effective if we could bring at least this element of what I understand of the corporate kind of for-profit kind, of, uh, kind of realm in terms of accountability, in terms of measurement, in terms of kind of tracking, in terms of some management kind of principles to the nonprofit sector because that is in some ways where we are weakest and it would make those limited dollars uh, and capacity go a lot further if they were more effectively deployed. Um, I, I guess I am seeing small, at least in my experience, small uh, movements that way, where there is more uh, trainings being done and uh, hiring of people who kind of come, kind of switch and come and bring that more business sense into the nonprofit sector. And I think a more of an openness. Um, it, it's hard to generalize in the nonprofit field. There's such a wide spectrum in terms of how professional, the size, the, the, the longevity they've been around, you know, various different missions, approaches. So there's certainly, uh, on that spectrum, I guess you could say, there's certainly some in the nonprofit field that basically are going to put up walls and not going to want to go there. But I'm seeing a lot less um, and a lot more openness to wanting to go there because it is, it's critical. Uh, I would agree with that. I would agree with Robin's comments uh, enthusiastically. I, I think this is a huge problem. There are, are far too many nonprofits that lack basic management skills, financial skills, HR skills, IT. It's just, it, it's, it's tragic. Um, and uh, one thing I would say is if you are a professional uh, you know, who's worked all your life for a company and you want to do something different, think about working for a nonprofit. The nonprofit sector needs you. Find a cause that you care about. And you'll take a big pay cut, um, but if you can afford it, you can make an enormous difference. Uh, and you know, we, our CFO is this is her encore career. She came and worked for us when she was six, you know, she was sixty when she came to work for us. And it's just it's tremendous to have the, the level of expertise that she has from you know a, a thirty-year career, a CPA, a MBA, that kind of thing. And uh, you can make a huge difference at a nonprofit uh, in that regard. The other thing I would just say is that. So, so nonprofits, I mean, one of the great things about working for nonprofits is that everybody shares your mission. They're doing it because they believe it, not because they're motivated by money. Um, one, and it also, they're really nice. And, you know, not always. Sometimes the politics can be vicious, but in my organization and many other people are just, they're friendly. They, they're, they care about the humanity of their colleagues. And that's great, but that can also be a challenge. Because, quite frankly, if someone is performing really badly, they shouldn't be draining your resources through their salary. They need to be managed up or managed out. 
And most nonprofits don't have the discipline to do that. Um, and it's difficult. I mean, I, it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, because they're nice people. They don't want to you know, be judging their colleagues. But it's, it's needed. And if you're a professional from, with business experience, you can bring that to a nonprofit as well. The last thing I'll say is with companies, um, if a company is doing poorly, then it will, it will fail, it will go bankrupt, it will get bought out. And that's good. That's, that's you know, creative destruction. That's what our economy needs. Um, because they're shareholders and there's money at stake. With a nonprofit, unfortunately, you don't have that. There's no shareholders. Uh, there are far too many nonprofits, lots of little nonprofits that are not effective, uh, and they would be much better off merging with bigger nonprofits and pooling their resources and getting much more done. But you know, you have to convince the, the management of the nonprofit, the board of the nonprofit. Inevitably, that doesn't happen. The nonprofits don't think about it until they're in dire straits, and by that point, it's usually too late. So that's that's. Unfortunate, and I, I would encourage anyone in the nonprofit space to really think open mindedly would we be better off merging with another organization, a larger organization, smaller, as equal, as an acquisition, whatever? Usually the answer is going to be yes. We've got time for one more. Up front, right here. I, we spent three days this week, I was in three-day staff, all-day staff retreat, where all we talked about was both internally and externally, what do we do to dismantle structural racism and provide better opportunities within our organization, in our society as a whole. I mean, you, you, you look at the, the, the DC policy world, it's overwhelmingly white. You look at our panel up here today, the four of us are, are overwhelming. <laughs> um, but you know, we, we do not reflect the full diversity of the, what the field is and, and what it should be as well. Um, happily, I think that we're, we're really starting to challenge ourselves more on that. We're, I mean, there, there is a, a growing real understanding, not just, not just a belief, but an understanding of why often the people who are closest to the problems are the ones that have the best ideas about the solutions. They just don't have the avenues, usually, to, to find their way into those discussions. So looking for better ways to open up those avenues to people. Um, the more we can do in terms of loan repayment programs from all sorts of graduate programs and undergraduate programs is a huge help. But we, I, I think we really do need to look, though, structurally at our own organizations and what are the things we do that put up barriers. And unpaid internships is the perfect example. You know, somebody who, who needs to make money in the summer so they can help pay for their tuition and living expenses or pay back staggering loans can't work for nothing for at a think tank or can't even work for, you know, $3,000 stipend. I mean, that, that won't even get you funding. So we need to be looking at our own structures of how do we set up our jobs? How do we compensate them? Um, what kind of benefits do we offer? Where do we go and, and recruit? Um, and, and all of those kind of structures, because it, it, th those are structures of structural racism in and of themselves. Even from the best do-gooders in the world, we're, we're usually blind to our own inherent biases and prejudices because we're, we're so caught up in our notion of what good we're doing in the world that we, we don't look at what we're not doing. Um, and, I, and I think those kind of structures and the, that kind of self-examination is something that we're increasingly forced to do and must be forced to do even more. Nirvana, you want to take the last part of this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's a different context. I work in something more like international development and more and in London, not in the US. So I have different angst than, than some people might. One thing is, um, we, I was actually able to set salary bounds so that there was no more than two times, 2.12 times precisely between the highest and lowest paid person and give people stretch opportunities upward. That helps because it means people can earn a fair wage um, you know, throughout the team. But the other thing that really helps is to not hire on credentials. And I do find that, that people in development and nonprofit are the most amazing intellectual snobs. I mean, they, they look for you know, a compensation of great degrees and so on. And I made it very clear that was not at all important to me. What was important to me was um, experience and aptitude very much tied to what they were going to be doing day to day. So my country lead in Bangladesh you know, is and my country in Pakistan, I didn't even look at where they went to university. I looked at what they had been doing in the last 15, 20 years um, and how those exact skills replicate. And I wish more people would do kind of gender-blind hiring because actually that gets you a fair result than trying to retroactively impose diversity criteria, in my opinion. I'm sure we can have a conversation about that later. Fantastic. Well, that's the end of this panel, but I hope that you'll join us tomorrow at 
a nonprofit networking event from 1 to 2 in Shapiro Hall 129. Of course, we'll all be mingling over the next couple of days, and I hope that you'll corner these panelists and have an opportunity to, have an opportunity to hear more about their incredible work. Thanks for your time.